So the theme here is the Agenda 2030 and uh, Goal 14 in relation to other goals. So today it's number 13, is it? Climate change. And 12. And 12. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Per Moxner, that is a colleague of mine. Uh, since 2012, I think we started the Soro program that you will present. <laughs> Maybe I should also say that when Per first told, we, there was a, a call for a transdisciplinary graduate school and uh, there was uh, supposed to be supervisors from two different faculties and Per said, well, should we uh, write a project on, on eelgrass? And I'm very interested on collaborating over disciplines, but at that point I said, well, Per, I like you very much, but no, that's where my, my limit is. <laughs> I cannot do that. But he well, he's quite stubborn and went on. And uh, th that is a positive thing, I bet. And then he said combination effects. Uh, no, compensation. Compensation. Uh, and that was an idea I had since a long time ago. And, and that's how it started from my perspective. So as Lina said, uh, I've been giving the task to connect this goal 14, life and the environment. And I will talk about this sustainable consumption and development as well as, as to mitigate climate change. So I'll try to, to come back to those things. As Lena said, uh, this work that I will present is part of a bigger research group, the research program that we call SORO. It's a name that is easy to remember, but it stands for Sostra Restoration. And that's how we started working with how to restore through ecological compensation or just ecological restoration. And we have a lot of large group from different disciplines, Lena being from the law, department and a marine ecologist and we also work with economists and of course also with the administrative county boards, land students and as well as as Hall, Hafsalatten and Vietnam, the Swedish Water and Management Agency, something like that. I never learned that name. Hall. Swamp. <laughs> Swamp. Swamp. It's easy. Mm -hmm. Alright, so in this presentation I will tell you a little bit about what is eelgrass, why it's important, what's threatening it and in a lot of challenges that we stand in for, but it's one of my main goal today is to convince you that this particular habitat, this plant, is quite important for the coast and for us humans as they provide many ecosystem services. And I will end this presentation by a more or less world premiere of a little promotion video about eelgrass that we will now show the full length of. Alright, so let's start talking about eelgrass. <coughs> what is that? Eelgrass is part of seagrasses, which is flowering plants. They are not algae like kelp, tongue. No, this, they come from land. They have evolved from land plants that have sort of migrated into the sea and adapted to life in the marine environment. They are quite unique if you compare to, to like kelp and algae, that they can attach themselves to sand and mud bottoms, which algae normally cannot. And that makes them quite unique, and they can fill that with with habitat, this type of environment, and otherwise maybe be more like a desert. That's part why they are quite important. And like uh, flowering plants on land, they have flowers, they produce pollen, and they're pollinated underwater, and they produce seeds that can develop into plants. <coughs> and in Swedish waters, the seeds are produced in late summer, they are dropped to the bottom, they sink, and then they lie there until early spring when they germinate. And they produce this type of, of seed leaves. They're quite small, but they grow into full plants that can be up to a meter tall in the first year. So they are quite rapid reproduction. But they can also grow like like weed in your garden, like kvikrot through this rhizomal growth or clonal growth, if you like. They just shoot these rhizomes to the side and they develop new shoots. And these can become very large. If you see a, a patch like this table, it can be just one individual. A little bit like wheat sippur in the Swedish forest. There's a lot of rhizomes on the ground. And in the Baltic Sea, where sexual reproduction disease is not so common, they can grow like this for a very long time. Through genetic studies, I have found one 100 meter wide meadow to consist of one individual, probably over a thousand years old. So they're quite remarkable plants. I mean, they're 
not like algae, these are special. <laughs> and they're quite important for the marine environment, not just because they are cool. They fulfill many different important functions for the ecosystems. Uh, in Sweden, eelgrass is the most the dominating type of seagrass. There's a lot of limnic, similar type of plants in the Baltic Sea, but on the west coast, this is what we mainly have. And historically, it has grown on shallow, soft sediment, as I would say, mud and sand bottoms, basically everywhere along the coast from Norway into the Baltic and up to about the Stockholm archipelago. Then the salinity becomes too sweet, not enough salinity for them to, to, to fur. So about up to Stockholm is the limit to them, all on the archipelago. <coughs> so why are these important? I think the most important role they play in the ecosystem is that they create a new type of environment, habitat, in the sand and mud bottoms. If there's no eelgrass, there will be more like a desert. And if you have eelgrass, you will have like a jungle. And because they grow there, they change not only the biological environment, but also the physical, the oceanography, the wave energy, and also the chemical environment. <clears throat> They're therefore referred to as, as engineers, or biological ecosystem engineers. The right zones stabilize the bottom, so the sediment doesn't move around. And the big blades, that dampens the wave energy and the currents. So everything becomes more stable, if you like. And that also means that a lot of particles in the water will sort of be filtrated by this canopy of leaves. It will slow down the currents and the particles will sink down. So they accumulate a lot of organic materials. And we'll come back to that as well. So you have an environment that is full of of growth then. Because on the leaves you have smaller algae that grows and then you have small invertebrates like uh, crustaceans, like sh small uh, shrimps, amphipods, and snails that move around the leaves and they attract larger maybe crabs and shrimp and fish and you have like an ecosystem there and all of that will not be there if it wasn't for, for the universe. So they stabilize the bottom and because they filter the water and stop sediments from being swooshed up from the bottom and resuspended, they makes the water much clearer and they create a habitat for a large number of species. So they increase biodiversity, and through all of this different function, they provide something important also for us uh, humans. And that is what is referred to as ecosystem services. It's something from nature that benefits us humans. And I will explain that a little bit more. One example of that is the ability for the meadows to trap organic material. And when it lands inside the meadow, there is no currents there, and it's because of that, the, the bottom becomes free of oxygen very quickly. So the sediment is anoxic. It's actually quite a toxic compound called sulfur in the sediment. It, it's, it's not a nice environment, but not even for bacteria. So everything that falls down in there stops. So the carbon and nutrients that falls into the sediment in the meadow get preserved. It's not biodegraded very much at all. So it becomes like a sink that accumulates organic material, both carbon and nutrients. And when I have studied this, this is different areas. This is the Swedish West Coast in the Baltic and other places. To the left, you see the Swedish West Coast in this sheltered fjord environment. Exceptionally high levels of carbon in the sediment. It's the world record here in, in the Skagen at Kattegat Sea. For some reason, you get very high levels of nutrients and carbons in these meadows. So, uh, and if you compare it, it's hard to see here, these two different measurements of carbon. This is without any vegetation, and this is with eelgrass. You get much higher levels of carbons when you have eelgrass because they stabilize the environment. If you don't have the eelgrass, the carbon will get swooshed up by the waves and transported away and become bioavailable. All right. So because of this, they work as a carbon sink and they mitigate climate change. And that is something that benefits us because there's a lot of costs associated with climate change. <coughs> Beach erosion and, and melting glaciers and another so it's a term that's quite popular, it's called blue carbon. It's like mangroves, marsh areas, and seagrasses that can actually trap and accumulate as a sink carbon, and that is referred to as blue carbon. It's a, it's a trendy term at the moment. But this is only one of the many ecosystem services that eelgrass can provide, the blue carbon. In a similar way, they also trap and accumulate nitrogen, phosphor, and, and and other nutrients in the, in, the, in the water that is no longer available for eutrophication and other problems that I will come back to. They also provide 
like a nursery habitat for many fishes, including recreational important species like sea trout and also commercial species like cod and eel and, and other species. They make the water clear because of this filtration and stabilization effect, so it's more nice for recreation. And they stabilize the beaches so you have less beach erosion. And altogether, that improves what we like when we go to the coast. Clear water, lots of fish, and, and fun time. So if you take away the eelgrass, you start getting less of all those different services, and that's then not so good. As a little side story, you can also make very cool things out <coughs> of seagrasses and eelgrass. Particularly on Lassa, they still have eelgrass leaves on the roofs. This, this is isolation. And also in the walls. In Bohusland, it's tradition to put a lot of seagrass leaves in the walls because it doesn't burn and it never rots, so it's very good material. All right. Now over to the negative thing. There's a lot of threats. Seagrasses in general are under rapid decline worldwide. And eelgrass, same thing, maybe even one of the worst. There's a lot of different things that can negatively affect eelgrass meadows, and I will talk a little bit about the three top one here during this talk. And by the way, Lena, can we make this uh, presentation available if people want to? Is that is that a? Yeah, yeah, it will be yeah. excellent. I see people taking notes, so you don't have to get write yourself crazy. Okay, <coughs> eutrophication, too much nutrients. I think most of you have heard this term before. This is a, a, a very schematic view of what happens. Seagrasses, like all plants, they need nutrients. No nutrients, they will also die. But they are adapted to live in a nutrient poor environment. They can store nutrients in the right zone over winter and they can use them to grow in the next spring. So they're well adapted to clear water with little nutrients. If you get more nutrients, they start getting competition from small algae that grow on the leaves and, and shadows the leaves. That's not true. And also fast growing filamentous algae that, that grows very quickly. If you have nutrients, they can quickly absorb it and grow into thick mats. And they can cover the eelgrass and basically outcompete the eelgrass for space. So when you have more and more nutrients, you start sliding down this, this line here. And in the end, there's not even enough light for the macroalgae, the filamentous algae. And then you only have planktonic algae in that environment. <coughs> so you go from a benthic production to a pelagic in the water production. And here you can have something called a regime shift or phase shift, which means that it might be very difficult to turn the system back. Even if you turn down the, the nutrient knob and decrease the amount, the system might not come back by itself because of something called feedback mechanism and we'll come back to that. So along the Swedish West Coast in particular, we have this problem which is related to too much nutrients. So this type of algae grows very quickly, shadows the, the eelgrass bed. Sometimes they come so thick that it's lack of nutrients underneath, and then the whole bed can die in a couple of days. So during very warm weather condition, calm condition, the whole meadow can be knocked out in a short time. The ecosystem is complicated, and it, new research have found that this problem with algae mass like this are related also to too much fishing, when we take away all the big fish from the ecosystem, which is really a big problem in the Western Sea, particularly for many of the cod fishes, like the Atlantic cod itself. The Kattegat population is more or less crashed. The, the one in the North Sea is coming back, but still very few cod along the Swedish West Coast. If you like sport fishing, in the 70s you can catch a big cod from the cliffs in, here on the West Coast of Sweden. That's very difficult nowadays. So it's been a very large change. And here's a very schematic drawing of how this can affect the amount of algae. This is supposed to be eelgrass with some spots of algae here, and you have a small crustacean, a little amphipod that eats the algae, small fish that eats mm -hmm. the amphipods, and the big fish that eats the small fish. This is a, called a, a trophic chain. And here I will illustrate, if you put man into the picture, you have trouble. Here there is balance. There's enough of those to control the algae. But if you take away the cod, the control of the small fish is gone, you get more small fish, you get less of those, and the control of the algae is gone, that can now use all the nutrients in the water and expand. I will not linger on this one, but just explaining that the combination of overfishing and too much nutrients, eutrophication, can create this problem. It's more and more evidence and science to support this model. But this, of course, is 
very much a simplification of the whole system. Taken together, there's been more or less a catastrophe for the eelgrass bed in the northwest coast of Sweden, Västra Götalands län, Bohemsland area. More than 60% has vanished since the 1980s. And we can say that because in the 1980s there was a lot of very tedious commune people working that me measured exactly what, how much ingress we had in the early 1980s. And then scientists went back and checked it and they found out that most of it was gone. It's not evenly lost. In the Gullmarsfjord area the losses were quite little, whereas here in the south they were much more. The particularly troublesome is this area here uh, around this Kungälv area, the Hakefjord area, we have massive losses. We used to have the massive eelgrass beds. It's not the trivial amount of eelgrass that had disappeared. With some assumption and, and sort of extrapolating these numbers, it's equivalent of over 10,000 hectares of eelgrass. That's almost the size of the island of Schön. So it, it's a tremendous amount. It's a huge, huge forest on land to, to be compared with. So this has, of course, had large implication on not only the function, but also a lot of ecosystem services that I must mention. All right, the trouble area in the Hakefjord. In the early 80s, it was the northwest coast of Sweden. The largest beds were found in this area. It was a very intensive fishing for eel in this area. It's shallow, perfect condition for eelgrass to grow in. Revisiting in, uh, in the early 2000s, Almost 70% of the eelgrass uh, were gone. Some of the big beds here in the south completely gone. Uh, yes, mud flats left here now. When I started working with these questions in about this time, in early 2000, there was hope that we were coming to grips with the problem because there's been a lot of measures to decrease the nutrients that runs out to the sea to battle this eutrophication, different measures of land. And when you measure the water quality in these stations, it looks pretty good. Green and blue means the status as the, the, the framework, what's it called, the Water Framework Directive, Vatten Directive, indicates that the water conditions are quite good. And, and the secchi depth, the clarity of the water on those stations were actually improving. So you would think maybe the eelgrass can then recolonize and come back by itself. But there was no recovery at all. And we, when we were revisiting in collaboration with the, the administrative board in this area in 2015, to our dismay, the losses has continued. The water clarity is improving, but the eelgrass continues to die. What is going on? And here we started to wonder if we are within some sort of regime shift, that we might have pushed the system too far, that it's now basically a spiraling in the wrong direction. <clears throat> and I will talk a little bit about that. But basically, there's very little eelgrass left in this area. And when I started this project, we tried to use restoration to bring them back in this area, but nothing that we planted survived in this area, where they used to grow. So something has changed. Okay, so what's going on? The red area here marks where there used to be eelgrass. You can see some small green patches that where they are still alive in 2015. We wanted to find out what have happened, what has changed in this space. So we put out light meters and we used old maps to estimate how big area those meadows were in these four numbers here, one, two, three, four. Very big from 40 hectares to over 200 hectares, huge meadows basically. One hectare is 100 times 100 meters. <coughs> And they grew down to three and a half to four meters depth in the 1980s. So we put out light loggers in these areas that measures the light continuously the whole season. You just have to go back there and clean them. And then we can estimate how deep the eelgrass can grow today in the same areas. And we can see that there's a decrease between one meters to up to two meters. It's very murky water today where eelgrass used to grow. If you've been a very careful listener now, you might have an idea what has happened. Any suggestion? You cannot say. <laughs> <laughs> if you recall, I said initially that eelgrass has a very important function, that the rhizome stabilizes the bottom, and the leaves sort of stops the waves from reaching the bottom. It basically stabilizes the bottom when you have eelgrass. 
So if something kills the eelgrass, something else, you will have, sorry I forgot to say, you, the water clarity has not decreased there, but here. It's very local effects. <coughs> this is how it looks in these areas today, without anything that can stabilize the bottom. When we took this picture with the drone, that's our little boat right there, the water was clear. And then, early in the morning, the sea breeze started. This is in June. And as soon as the wind started to come in, small waves were created, and immediately, the, the very fine particles on the bottom was resuspended and created this. You can see it's a very local effect. Just on this shallow area where the waves can actually reach the bottom. Poof, visibility is gone. I couldn't see my hand in the water when I hold it like that. <clears throat> and this is not a good environment for egress to grow in. So basically you have an area, their feedback mechanism, in this case the resuspension of sediment prevents growth of vegetation. It happens so often, and because these particles are very fine, because we have a lot of glacial mud layered up in this area, they stay suspended <coughs> for almost a day before they can lie down. So if it's been, we know that because we try to work here and see things, if it's been a wind event a little bit more, we have to wait maybe three, four days before we can do any work. So it's, uh, it's very sensitive. And on top of that, we have a problem with something that is in an area of phot phot photography of another of these bays. <coughs> the red mark marks where the eelgrass used to be in the 1980s. You can see some darker patches. You might think it's eelgrass, but it's not. It's mats of macroalgae. This is algae that normally grows on rocks. It's fucus, sorg, tongue. That is uh, a natural, when it grows on rocks, very nice habitat for fishes and other things. But it can also grow in this free drifting form. And when the eelgrass disappeared, they have found this free space. So they are living on the bottom, growing, but preventing any eelgrass from coming back. Because they move with waves and particularly stronger wind events. And they will just rip off any shoots on the bottom or lie on top of it and, and suffocate the eelgrass. And when they move on the bottom, they're like a truck in the desert. It creates a lot of resuspension, like a cloud behind them. So they increase this resuspension. So together, this is really preventing eelgrass from coming back. We have tried all kinds of ways to plant eelgrass in this area. And without cages, they will not survive. So it's, it, the system has sort of locked itself. Once you lose the eelgrass, you're in trouble. Let me walk you through what I just talked about. When you have eelgrass, the sediment is stabilized. And the more eelgrass that grows, the clearer the water. And the more eelgrass it can grow again until it's sort of maximized in, in, in density or whatever. So it supports itself. It creates its own favorite environment. <coughs> But if you have some external factor, it could be a storm, it could be too much nutrient pollution or fishing creating this algae mat that kills the algae, it could be a dredging or building of a pier, that you weaken the eelgrass. You reach a threshold when the eelgrass is no longer stabilizing the bottom enough. So more resuspension creates less growth of eelgrass, fewer shoots, even more resuspension, and it sort of spirals in the wrong direction. You have feedback mechanism that prevents it. When the eelgrass becomes sparse, it no longer prevents this algae to enter the meadows because it works like a fence when it's dense. When it's not dense, the algae can enter and start growing and competing, and in the end, outcompete the eelgrass. So in the end, this is what we have now. Very murky water, very turbid water, and lots of these algae mats on the bottom, which do not uh, produce the same ecosystem services as egress. It's not very much liked by small fish like cod, for instance. It doesn't stabilize the bottom. It doesn't help to accumulate this carbon and nitrogen, etc. So it, it's not this good. I think it might be very difficult to get it back. That's sort of the take-home message. So protect, protect, protect. I will now talk a little bit about <coughs> shortly, the ecosystem services that has been lost here. We used to have a lot of eelgrass here. If you can see the red numbers here along the coast is where we have lost eelgrass. We have sampled the sediment 
to see what happens to the sediment once you lose the ingress. We talked about there should be a lot of carbon there, but what happens when you lose the ingress? Does the, the carbon and nutrients leave the ingress? I mean, the, the sediment or not? And the answer is yes. This is an ingress bed in, on average, all these different locations, down to 35 centimeters depth. So this is going into the sediment. This is the deepest point. And this is without any ingress, where it used to be ingress. So there is a loss of about 130% of the carbon in the sediment, down to 35 centimeters depth. On a whole hectare, that's 54 tons of carbon that has disappeared. That's the minimum. That's just the difference. If you estimate that this thing eroded and you're down to zero, that it just got pushed up by the waves, the losses are even larger. This was a bit surprising when we found and looked at nutrients, which has been much less studied and not evaluated very much. There was a very high levels of nutrients in the egress metals, the highest I've seen in the literature. And the losses of nitrogen is even higher in proportion. It's much, it's only one tenth of the amount of nutrients, nitrogen compared to carbon. But nitrogen is in some ways more valuable because it's very hard to clean from cleaning plants and such. So when you try to value this in in ecosystem terms, if you try to put how many Swedish kroners that this is this worth, it makes a big difference. <clears throat> There's many ways, most of them not so good, to try to transform this ecosystem service of storing carbon into money. But one way with carbon is to use something called the social cost of carbon, which is an estimate globally on how much does it cost when you have uh, one ton of carbon for the climate damage that happens. So there are numbers provided by that. And one of the reasons one is almost a thousand kroners per ton. You do the math and you come up with 50,000 Swedish kroners for one hectare. Not that much money. So carbon is rather cheap, it is estimated. For <coughs> what was a bit more surprising is that this is very high numbers compared to what we've seen before maybe 20, 30 times higher. Here, nutrients is hard to estimate, but one way to do it is to say, okay, we release a ton of nutrients in this bay. How much would it cost to take up that nutrient or clean it with land measure, like a, a wastewater treatment plant, or planting um, uh, wetlands, or, or other type of measures that you do? <coughs> you can come up with a number, this is just an average, it's not uh, locally specific, but around 200 kroners per kilo. Much, much, much more expensive. You do the math and you come up with this number, which is tremendous. A million kroner per hectare. This is much, much higher than has been presented before. And this is really an, an eye-opener. And this is unpublished results, but uh, you're the first to, to learn. This is really <laughs> so this is a bit, wow. We were in the, in the area of 100,000 kroners before we estimated this. <clears throat> we have now found out that this nitrogen goes down very deep. It doesn't, it's not broken down as expected. So there's a lot of nitrogen in these meadows, and they are lost when we lose the universe. So they are then being recirculated and causing eutrophication and trouble. So there's a lot of money in the ingress bed. <clears throat> All right, let's play with the math a little bit here for, for final. There are many ecosystem <coughs> services. I have worked with an economist, Scott Cole, before. We can estimate how many juveniles that you lose if you lose an egress compared to a mud bottom. And this is if you lose almost a thousand hectares in this area. This is how much money it's worth over 20 years if you estimate that the egress got lost in the 1990s. We don't really know when it happened. It's a lot of money. Carbon, about the same amount of money estimating also that there's no egress there that makes carbon accumulate anymore in the last 20 years. You do it for nutrients. It's close to a billion kroners just in this little area, just for those two communes or three communes involved in this. That's a lot of money. And this is low estimates. And we haven't even started to estimate the worth of deterioration of water quality. We don't really know how to do that. Or the loss of biodiversity. There's a lot of assumption when you try to put money on 
on these type of ecosystem services. I think the take home message is they worth a lot mm. to us humans. That's the take home message. It can have a value. I, I'm ambivalent to the use of valuing in monetary terms ecosystem services, but sometimes it could be good to have a number when you try to fight this. Because a commune could say, we need this marina, this harbor, because it will provide this many jobs and it's worth that much money to the commune. Uh, commune is not uh, the English term for commune. What is it called? Municipality. Municipality. Something like that. Municipality. So that's when it could have a value to have to say, but this actually is worth over a million Swedish kroners, this little area. You should protect it because it's good for your environment. So I will end to talk a little bit about this issue because there is a competition between eelgrass and humans in the coast. Because we love these shallow bays that are protected from waves where we can have a pier, we can swim, etc. But that's where eelgrass normally grow. So there is sort of a competition. We need to find a way to, to be together. <clears throat> but the first question is, does this really matter for eelgrass? Sometimes they seem to grow quite a bit among the boats in the, in the marinas. So we did a study to assess this because there's quite a few marinas and there's about 50 piers and two marinas added every year along the Swedish west coast. It's constantly growing and sort of chipping on the last base. <clears throat> there's a lot of pressure to build these things. There's a lot of growth. There's a lot of people who want to spend the summers on the coast. So. Uh, it's good to know if all these different impacts together, cumulatively, can have an, an effect on the U.S. In, on the large term. So uh, uh, Lena's and our former PhD students, they did a joint legal and ecological work when they looked at this impact. First they measured light and the, how much eelgrass you have under piers. And what you see here is two types of piers, elevated piers on poles, the one that, you know, bring in and that stands up, and the new type, quite popular, the floating piers that lies on the water surface, which apparently blocks the light much more efficient because they're closer to the water. And you can see here that under the pier, straight underneath, very little eelgrass growth. In the floating dock, it's completely gone. But up to six meters away from the pier, you also see a negative impact of the dock possibly because the boats are more there and they also block the light. Or maybe propeller uh, turbulence that creates sedimentary suspension, etc. So floating docks are twice as bad as elevated docks. That's good to know when you try to give permits. And taken together, counting all the piers through the aerial photographies and seeing the impact on average from one pier, about 500 hectares of eelgrass are negatively affected. That's about 7% of all the eelgrass on the Swedish northwest coast. So they are important. It's not, they're not so, sm so small that you can ignore it. These are not dead, but they are negatively affected. Okay, and the last thing I will talk about is we have a lot of protection installed through this marine protected area, MPAs as they are called. And very good. Half of all the eagles that we know about on the Swedish Northwest Coast are found inside these type of MPAs, like Natura 2000 areas, etc. So that's very good. Today, though, one third of them doesn't have anything written in the, you know, the term regulations about that you should protect the marine environment. They've been installed maybe because there were nice trees on land and then they just extended it out in the water a little bit, which is a drawback and could partly explain this not so nice results from the legal part of this study. In all the cases when they apply to have an exception from what's called the shore protection law, you're not allowed to build a pier because it infringes on the shore protection, so you need an exception from that. No one mentioned eelgrass, although in most cases we knew it was there when they applied for it, and no one demanded them to present information about the eelgrass. Outside marine protected areas, 88% of the cases were given permission. Oh, sorry, exception from the, <laughs> that's the right way of saying it. She's trying to teach me. Yeah. And this is the bad news. Almost 70% within the marine protected area, like Natura 2000 areas, still got the exception. 
even though there we know there was eelgrass where they built the pier. <coughs> so the protection in this case for eelgrass is not working today. So that's a bit of an eye-opener. We need to work more with this for this type of protection to actually have an effect. And the most common reason is that it was viewed as a rather small impact from this one pier, or this marina, on the big scheme. So each of these cases did not look in the next bay or 100 meters away where there was another case in a similar way that we're building. So this sort of very sm isolated view we think is part of the problem. I must say in the defense of all those people working with this that the, the managers say no to many cases. But despite that, there's quite a lot of them that comes through. So it's every case when you build something where you have eelgrass, you're step one step more in the wrong direction. So, so it's a tough job for those people working with these type of questions. <coughs> As we give an example, a case, a little bay in the Gulmarsfjord Natura 2000 area, they want to build a little pier. It only infringed maybe 1% of the eelgrass bed there. All the, looks like a small effect in this area. And it's in this big fjord and it's this little bay right there. It doesn't really matter unless you take the landscape perspective and look at what else is built in the fjord. These are all the piers in the Gulmas fjord. This was the last bay in the Gulmas fjord without any pier. So you need this landscape pers perspective. That's very important. And we don't really know when we reach that threshold when the bad spiral is going down. In the Gulmarsford area, the eelgrass looks pretty good at the moment. It grows very shallow compared to 100 years ago, but it still looks okay. But we see this problem in the southern part, it's spreading northward. So we don't really know where those thresholds are, so we have to be very careful. When the spiral starts, we can't do much. All right, a lot of negative talk here. So what are we going to do about it? Within this sorrow group, we have worked a lot to produce reports and guidelines on what's the problem today. I've told you a little bit about those problems. What can we do better? We have suggestions how to do this now. We have also developed methods how to restore ingress. And so the methods are available if the environment pro, uh, pro, permits it. If you reach that spiral, it doesn't matter what you do at the moment. But we're still working on those questions too. And we also have guidelines for ecological compensation. <coughs> So this is available, so a good tool for managers to use today. And all of this has been done in collaboration with the uh, administrative county boards and uh, HAL, as I said, because I can't say it in English, the, the national uh, uh, managers. We also have provided little uh, YouTube video films, so if you want to see how to restore eelgrass and plant them, you can check this site out. Just Google eelgrass and sorrow and you will find it in English and Swedish. And very good news is also that there is a new action plan or JS program with concrete steps. What do we need to do? And at least on paper, a lot of money that comes with it. 88 millions. Sounds like a lot, but we just learned the value of one ingress bed, right? So it's not that much of <laughs> So this in summary of the most important step is to keep working on improving the environment decrease nutrient pollution, get the big fish back, fish back into the system. Protect, protect, protect what you have left, because if you lose too much, it might spiral in the wrong direction and you might be stuck. And to use restoration, but it's very expensive, like one and a half, two million kroners per hectare if you do the monitoring of everything. So it's, you don't want to be in the position where you need to restore. But sometimes, like in the harbor of Gothenburg, but the nation decides we have to build this new port, so eelgrass is going to suffer. Then you can say, okay, but then you have to plant. And that is what happened in Gothenburg uh, Harbor. They have to do the ecological compensation. <coughs> and important is also to increase the awareness of the value of eelgrass meadows. So people know, because most of the time they don't even know what it is, and that it matters if you put your anchor in certain areas. <coughs> 